It is a great pleasure to give you this presentation today. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity. So today I'm going to talk to you about targeting cancer cells by altering pre-mRNA splicing. Now, apologies in advance to any of you who may not be molecular biologists. I will try to keep the jargon to a minimum and um, emphasize the key points as much as possible. So today I'm going to start first by giving you a very brief introduction to pre-mRNA splicing and why, what it is, why it's important, and why it might be relevant to cancer. And then I'm going to describe two approaches that my research group has taken in terms of developing potentially new therapeutic avenues um, towards developing new treatments for cancer. So what is pre-mRNA splicing and why is it important in cancer? So splicing was discovered in the late 1970s. Um, the discoverers of uh, splicing, uh, Robertson Sharp, eventually got the Nobel Prize for their pioneering work. Now, essentially, what it boils down to is that genes made of DNA produce uh, pre-mRNA transcripts. So these are precursors of messenger RNAs that need to be processed in the nucleus in all sorts of complicated ways, which I won't go into today, but uh, pertinent to today's talk is this process of splicing where we have exons and introns. Now these introns need to be removed from the pre-mRNA to make the mature spliced messenger RNA. And that is the, the reaction of splicing, which is biochemically quite complex. Now, what then became obvious uh, particularly in the early 80s and then moving on through the 80s and 90s, is that genes or exon, multi-exon genes are alternatively spliced. So if you look here on this diagram, so you can see that exons are represented generally by uh, rectangles and introns by continuous lines, and the diagonal lines uh, show where splicing occurs. And um, you have the possibility of joining or splicing these exons together in different ways in the mature mRNA here on the right. So sometimes exons can be skipped. These are called cassette exons. So that means that the splicing machinery can include them. See the green exon here included in the mature mRNA, or they can be skipped. There are other modes of alternative splicing, mutually exclusive exons where either one or the other uh, is used, but never both. And alternative splice sites, so this relates to the precise position of where splicing occurs in the adjoining exons. So you can modulate then the length and you know the size of the alternatively spliced exons. And you also have intron retention where introns are sometimes not recognized by the splicing machinery and retained in the mature mRNA. There are other modes of alternative splicing, but we need not go into that today. The really important facts to, to point out here are that it is estimated that over 94% of human multi-exon genes are alternatively spliced. That is to say, the vast majority of our genes. So whatever genes you might be interested in in your cancer research, chances are they're alternatively spliced. And the consequences of this alternative splicing are profound because it can mean that you can actually then encode for a different protein isoform. And these splice isoforms or versions of proteins uh, that arise from alternative splicing can have radically different and even antagonistic properties. So we have about 20,000 genes or so, um, but through alternative splicing, our cells can produce at least 100,000 proteins and probably a lot more than that. So we can amplify then the ability of our genome to express um, you know, proteins through alternative splicing. How is alternative splicing regulated? Now here I'm going to keep this uh, as straightforward as possible. So exons and introns shown here in the diagram have so-called splice sites that define their boundaries. And these splice sites are recognized by proteins called splice factors and a machinery called the spliceosome, which is very complex um, and involves a number of ribonucleoprotein nucle complexes that recognize very precise, precisely the location of the splice sites and then catalyze uh, two transesterification reactions which 
essentially result in the exons being joined precisely together. Now, I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty of that today because it's extremely, extremely complicated. Um, exonic splice enhancers are regulatory sequences usually uh, uh, that promote splicing or the use of a particular exon, for example. Um, there are also exonic splice uh, silences and intronic splice enhancers and silences. So these are regulatory sequences within pre-mRNAs that are bound, that are recognized by these splice factors that then uh, facilitate the regulation of alternative splicing. Now the SR proteins are widely studied uh, group of splice factors. They have a serine arginine enriched domain. They are very widely studied and have been extensively implicated in oncogenic processes and we'll be looking at uh, a prime example of this later in the talk today. Now, <coughs> another very important fact here is that one in six disease-causing mutations are thought to disrupt splicing. So with the fact that the vast majority of our, gene, of our genes are multi-exon and are alternatively spliced, it is then not surprising that there are lots of disease-causing mutations, including mutations linked to cancer, that disrupt splicing. Now, without going into too much detail here, but there are mutations that can affect all, all sorts of things. So you can have mutations in regulatory sequences within exons and introns that regulate splicing. You can have mutations in the actual splice sites. You can also have very subtle mutations that alter these, the structure of pre-messenger RNA, which then can have a bearing on the efficiency of splicing uh, at a particular uh, site. But the, the really salient point here is that one in six disease-causing mutations disrupt splicing, and then you won't be surprised to he hear then that there are many cancer-causing or cancer-associated mutations in which splicing is disrupted. And this is a nice uh, figure taken from Coltre et al. Review, um, where they talk about uh, alterations in splicing that occur in tumor progression. So, first of all, there are splice isoforms of important cancer-associated genes that can have uh, differing properties um, and even antagonistic properties. For example, pro-apoptotic, anti-apoptotic. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So splice isoforms in cancer cells tend to favor the prevention of cell death, so they tend to be anti-apoptotic. So there are changes in splicing of these genes that make their effects, their biological effects, more anti-apoptotic. And the splice factors, the protein factors that regulate alternative splicing, and a number of these are listed here. Uh, for example, SRSF1, this is an oncogenic SR protein splice factor. They are implicated okay, uh, in all stages of cancer uh, development and progression, from the primary tumor uh, and irregular proliferation to then the ability of tumor cells to invade and spread around the body, including the ability to form distant metastases, and also the promotion of angiogenesis of new blood vessels that supply uh, the, the tumors. And these splice factors then are central in the regulation of splicing events that participate in all of the hallmarks of cancer. And these splice factors can be upregulated, downregulated, mutated, all sorts of things can and do go wrong in cancer relating to splice factors. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a background uh, on uh, alternative splicing uh, uh, and how it is relevant to cancer. So and I want to talk about two approaches uh, that uh, I have taken over the years in terms of looking at ways to manipulate the splicing machinery uh, to achieve uh, anti-cancer outcomes. So the first of these is to target the so-called splice factor kinases. So kinases or protein kinases are enzymes that add phosphate groups to splice factors. So just a little background on them. So this is a nice figure taken from a review by Naro and Sette. And without going into too much detail here, but essentially you have the nucleus here on the right with nascent pre-messenger RNAs that are being transcribed from their genes and splice factors and the, the spliceosome are basically binding to these pre-mRNAs and uh, mediating splicing and regulating alternative splicing. And the SR proteins, as I mentioned before, are a very important and abundant uh, class of splice factors. And they are phosphorylated in the cytoplasm mainly 
by protein kinase called SRPK1, SR protein kinase. It phosphorylates these SR proteins, and that phosphorylation favors their accumulation into the nucleus. And then in the nucleus, there are additional splice factor kinases that contribute to their activation, and I'll come on to these uh, in, uh, in a bit. So, focusing on this splice factor kinase SRPK1, we've done a lot of work on this. So I just want to give you a snapshot of what we've been doing. So, for instance, if we look at its expression in the context of prostate cancer, we could see that in uh, a number of prostate cancer cell lines that its expression, shown here on the left, is elevated in these prostate cancer cell lines compared to normal cells. But as well as cell line models, when we look at a cohort of patients, we can see elevated expression of SRPK1 in malignant tissue in particular uh, compared to benign tissue. Okay, so we did some work on this. So to cut a long story short, um, the uh, um, one of my collaborators, Professor Dave Bates, who used to work at Bristol University and he's now a professor of oncology, of oncology at Nottingham University, uh, has been very interested in uh, these uh, splice factor kinases and developed a spin-out company called Exxon8 uh, that is uh, focused on developing specific chemical inhibitors of the splice factor kinase SRPK1. And in particular, they are developing compounds known as Sphinx compounds, and these are potent and specific inhibitors of this SRPK1 protein kinase. So this is just one experiment that we did here in collaboration with Seb Oltian's group at Exeter University who does the actual mouse work. And what you have here is um, prostate cancer cells that are, in, uh, that are injected orthotopically into nude mice. So these are immunocompromised mice, uh, orthotopically meaning directly into the mouse prostate. And they, uh, they have a fluorescent tracker so you can, you can track their spread. So in the control, you can see that over a period of a month, uh, these tumor cells have spread all over the abdomen uh, of the mice. But mice treated with sphinx, uh, the tumor cells really struggle to grow, and this is quantified in, uh, in the graph below. So the inhibition of this particular uh, splice factor kinase seems to have potent uh, anti-cancer properties. It doesn't adversely affect the mice in any other way at the doses given, but it certainly seems to have a very powerful effect on the growth of the xenografted uh, tumor cells. And this is another experiment sort of linked to that. Um, so here we are linking the effects of uh, either genetically knocking down or inhibiting SRPK1 on a downstream effect, which is the alternative splicing of a growth factor called VEGF. So VEGF stands for Vascular Endothelial Growth Factor. It is a widely studied growth factor with tens of thousands of publications worldwide on it. And it is required for angiogenesis, that is to say the formation of blood vessels for pre-existing blood vessels. And it's involved in angiogenesis both in physiological uh, context, so during the menstrual cycle, for example, or in wound healing, but it's also involved in pathological processes, including in cancer, because obviously one of the hallmarks of cancer is angiogenesis, because tumors need blood supply uh, to, uh, to, to receive oxygen and nutrients. So tumor cells produce VEGF uh, to promote uh, the proliferation of blood vessels. Now, VEGF was thought to be originally an exclusively angiogenic growth factor. However, Dave Bates and colleagues discovered a novel splice isoform of VEGF that is anti-angiogenic. Like I said before, splice isoforms often exhibit completely antagonistic properties. Now you're probably wondering why should there be an anti-angiogenic isoform, splice isoform of VEGF? Well, the reason is that there are some physiological contexts in which VEGF is required for other physiological processes, for example, in uh, infiltration in the kidney. Podocytes in the kidney express VEGF, but they express uh, predominantly the B isoform because they don't require any novel angiogenesis, but they require VEGF for their normal physiology. You won't be surprised to learn then that we find that in solid tumors in particular, 
there is a shift in splicing in VEGF towards the proangiogenic isoform. So not only do tumors express more VEGF because it's in, the, in their interest to do so, they also shift the splicing of VEGF towards the androgenic isoform. And so this kind of illustrates another point that what can and does go wrong in tumors and cancers as they progress through their different stages is that not only are genes mutated and switched on or switched off, deleted or whatever, but their splicing can also change to favor the expression of splice isoforms that favor uh, the tumor. So coming back to SFPK1, what we see is that with Sphinx, or the inhibitor of SFPK1, we get uh, an elevated expression of the anti-angiogenic isoform of VEGF, the B isoform. Now with a knockdown experiment on the left, this is where we uh, use te uh, genetic techniques to reduce the expression of the SRPK1 gene, and therefore meaning that there's less uh, protein kinase in the cells. What we see is that we, uh, we get a drastic slowdown in the growth of the, 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 the xenograph, so the tumor volume over a period of weeks does not grow as much if we knock down uh, the SRPK1 gene. But we can rescue this phenotype if we concurrently overexpress proangiogenic VEGF, suggesting that the effect of the knockdown on slowing down tumor growth is to a large extent driven by change in splicing of VEGF towards the antiangiogenic. But if you flood these tumor cells with proangiogenic VEGF, regardless of what you're doing to SRPK1, they grow very happily indeed. And we, we know how this works now because we have identified uh, the splice factors involved in this regulation. They're phosphorylated by SRPK1, and as a result, they drive the expression of proangiogenic VEGF. So coming back to Exonate and Dave Bates' spin-out company in Nottingham, the development of these Sphinx compounds are being used for the time being in clinical studies for the treatment of eye disease in which there is abnormal angiogenesis. By inhibiting SRPK1 there is very strong evidence that you can actually possibly be uh, producing novel drugs for the treatment of eye diseases. And the next step will also be to look to explore these drugs uh, possibly as novel anti-cancer uh, drugs. So, continuing then on the theme of splice factor kinases, I mentioned earlier that there are other splice factor kinases that uh, phosphorylate these splice factors and modulate their function, and these include the clicks or CDC2-like kinases, and these are thought to work predominantly in the nucleus. What they do is they additionally phosphorylate these SR protein splice factors, recruiting them from sites of storage called nucleus speckles, and um, augmenting their activity and facilitating their recruitment onto pre-mRNA uh, to mediate that uh, splicing, uh, the splicing reaction and alternative splicing. So there is also evidence that the cliques, uh, like SRPKs, the SRPKs are implicated in cancer, so we have been looking at them as well. And here we've used a, a compound called TG0003, which is a benzothiazole developed by Professor Hagiwara in uh, Kyoto University in Japan. And uh, I'll just quickly go through this. So basically what we see is in two independent uh, prostate cancer cell lines here on the top, that we get a reduction in proliferation when we treat these cells uh, with this TG003 CLIC1 inhibitor. And below what we see here is a concurrent increase in apoptosis. So this is programmed cell death, because cells, in particular cells where there is extensive DNA damage, right, they can undergo uh, deliberate programmed cell death called apoptosis. And what cancer cells do, and indeed one of the hallmarks of cancer, is to evade apoptosis. So if we inhibit CLIC1, we get a huge uh, significant increase in apoptosis in uh, these two ca uh, prostate cancer cell lines, PC3 and DU145, and we also observe this uh, phenomenon in PNT2 cells, which are normal prostate uh, epithelium cells as well. Suggesting that not only is CLIC1 uh, involved in the regulation of cell proliferation, but also in the regulation of apoptosis, presumably by phosphorylating key splice factors that in turn regulate the splicing of genes involved in these processes. 
We can also do uh, uh, migration and invasion assays in vitro, and this is where we are able to study the ability of these cancer cell lines uh, to migrate uh, and invade um, using uh, cell line uh, cell culture tricks, which I won't go into the detail just now. It's called a trans well assay. We also use a very simple technique called a scratch closure assay, where you essentially uh, create a gap. Uh, between two fields of cancer cells and ask how long it takes for that gap to be closed. So to cut a long story short, TG003 treatment, the CLIK1 inhibitor, uh, drastically reduces the ability of the cells to migrate and invade. Another oncogenic uh, feature, uh, possibly of CLIK1 function. And here we have, um, again, some mouse work uh, and this is also in collaboration with uh, Sebastian Oltian's lab at Exeter University. So again, this is uh, classical xenograft experiments. So here we grow um, up to 10 million uh, prostate cancer cells that are injected subcutaneously into these new uh, immunocompromised uh, mice. And the tumors, although the tumor cells grow uh, very aggressively over a period of, of weeks. And you can see here on the graph the growth of those uh, tumors. But when we uh, inject these mice per intraperitoneally with TG003, the CLIK1 inhibitor, it seems to drastically reduce the growth of these xenografts. And we're very intrigued by these findings and plan to take this further, obviously. Now, I have to say that at the doses that we use, um, and, and over a period of weeks, and there are multiple treatments per week, um, the compound does not seem to have an adverse, an obvious adverse effect on, on the mice at these doses. But obviously, on the t but the tumor cells are presumably extremely sensitive to, uh, to CLIK1 inhibition. Now, with any kinase inhibitors, of course, there's the issue of specificity. Um, so, you know, it's conceivable that additional kinases may also be being in, uh, inhibited here. Um, more specific inhibitors of clicks um, are currently being developed, and we hope to be testing some of these in the lab soon. But as a proof of principle, we also think that the inhibition of the click splice factor kinases may be potentially therapeutically interesting. Okay, so that completes uh, the first approach, which is the uh, experimenting with uh, the inhibition, or targeting, if you like, of the so-called splice factor kinases. So bear in mind that um, protein kinases are very important in, in cancer, in cell signaling, in, in normal physiology and development, and of course in cancer, in all sorts of contexts. And drugs that target protein kinases have been around for many, many years and are, and are you know, given to patients currently. We think that there is potential for developing uh, new molecules that are inhibitors specifically of the splice factor kinases, because we think these are uh, you know, really important in the regulation of, uh, of alternative splicing. OK, so then the second approach here. Um, and here we are going to be talking about um, antisense technology, and please excuse the jargon, and I'll go, go through it in a minute. Splice switching oligonucleotide to target the ERG oncogene. So first of all, some background about the ERG oncogene. This is considered to be a key oncogene in prostate cancer in that it is activated in a staggering proportion of cases, something like 50%, one in two. This is an oncogene that uh, encodes a transcription factor. These are proteins that regulate the transcription, so the activity of genes. How does it get activated in men who get prostate cancer? So the, the ERG gene is uh, closely located to another gene called TMPRSS2, which encodes a prote uh, serine protease. And the TMPRSS2 gene is switched on by an androgen-responsive promoter. Promoters are sequences that switch genes on. And the TMPRSS2 promoter is androgen-responsive. So there's a deletion that occurs by a quirk of molecular genetics, which favors, uh, makes it relatively likely that this deletion can occur. It fuses the TMPRSS2 promoter to the ergoncogene, 
inappropriately switching it on. So here we have a representative immuno um, in situ, sorry, rather in situ hybridization uh, from a, a patient here with a deletion. Uh, you can see here on the right. So the, so the green signal here represents the interstitial DNA, and it's lost in this patient who happens to be T um, ERK positive because there's a fusion with a TMPRSS2 promoter because of the deletion. So we looked at a number of um, patients here in uh, Bristol, and we analyzed uh, ERG expression by traditional immunohistochemistry uh, by my postdoc at the time, Rachel, Dr. Rachel Hagen, also extracted RNA uh, from uh, these tumor specimens. Um, these were paraffin-embedded formalin-fixed, so it was quite challenging to extract the RNA, but she was able to do that and use qPCR, which is a standard a quantitative PCR technique to measure the expression of a gene of interest, in this case ERG, and what she saw was that as the pathological stage of disease went up in the cohort, the expression of ERG increased. So the more advanced the prostate cancer, the higher the ERG expression, presumably because the ERG oncogene is driving the oncogenic phenotype of, uh, of the cancer cells. I don't have uh, time to go into the, uh, the detailed biology of the ERG uh, transcription factor, but it's known to be involved in all sorts of developmental processes, in the regulation of proliferation, of androgenesis, of apoptosis, of differentiation. So it's a potent um, oncogene, uh, ERG, and it seems to be implicated in prostate cancer, switched on because of that quirk, that mole molecular time bomb in us men, uh, where this deletion can occur, uh, activating it when it shouldn't be. And then as the disease progresses, there may be a selection for greater expression of this ERG oncogene because it drives the oncogenic phenotype. But it is also alternatively spliced. Not a surprise. After all, I told you that 94% of our genes are alternatively spliced. Now, there are multiple isoforms of ERGs. I just want to focus here on a cassette exon called exon 7B. It's a cassette exon then is an exon that can either be included or skipped. It's a mode, one of the modes of alternative splicing I mentioned earlier. Now it's in frame, which means it's in a multiple of three, so that if we skip it, we don't include 24 amino acids. And these are shown here. And these 24 amino acids are bang in the middle of the transcription factor, in fact, in the activation domain. And this is a part of the transcription factor that modulates its ability to do its job if you like, All right? We don't yet fully understand what these 24 amino acids are doing, but what we do know is that they have an evolutionarily conserved ERK docking site. Now, ERK is another protein kinase, and it docks, uh, it's thought to bind through this motif shown here, uh, uh, FFP, and this motif is conserved in evolution. So if we look at ERG homologs, from human all the way to sea urchin, they all have a cassette exon of exactly the same length with these 24 amino acids that are highly conserved through a very long time in evolution, and the motif is conserved, suggesting its functional importance. So we became interested in this isoform because there had been evidence in the literature that it might be linked to proliferation. So we looked at it in our um, prostate cancer cohort, so what Rachel saw then was that whereas in normal tissues, shown here below, exon 7B tends to be skipped, the lower PCR products, or the lower band, uh, which is more abundant, actually in the prostate cancer specimens, the, the black here shows the proportion of exon 7B inclusion, 7B inclusion seems to go up uh, as disease becomes more severe. So not only do the erg, um, sorry, do the prostate cancers want to express erg because of their own devious aims, but actually they want to change the splicing of ERG to include more of this um, uh, exon 7B. And that ERG docking site is likely to be central to the oncogenic properties of this cassette ex exon, because ERG is a protein kinase that's well integrated into cell signaling uh, uh, pathways that are linked uh, to cancer. Okay, so on to the kind of therapeutic idea, or, which is a, a very uh, early stage at the moment, but this is, um, I mean, the, so the use of antisense technology is not 
novel. It's been around for a long time. But what we specifically want to do here is to mess with the normal splicing of the ERG uh, pre precursor messenger RNA. So we used a chemistry called Morpholinos, provided or in invented and, and pr provided by a company called Gene Tools uh, in the States. And these are very stable uh, DNA derivatives. They can uh, they can be stable for many days following a single transfection into into tissues. So antisense molecules. So the principle is that through Watson Crick base complementarity, they can bind very specifically uh, to certain sequences. In this case, RNA. So we design these across splice sites, hence splice switching oligonucleotides. So the thinking is that. By binding across the splice sites, so here is one shown below the specific sequence here across um, the three prime splice site of exon 7b. The thinking is that they block the splicing machinery from recognizing that splice site and thereby cause the skipping of the exon. So if we cause the skipping of exon 4, the resulting mRNA is completely useless because you simply cannot uh, translate it into any kind of meaningful ERG protein. If we cause the skipping of exon 7b, we can still translate ERG protein, but it lacks this highly oncogenic cassette exon with that ERG docking site. So without going, getting too technical here, but these PCRs show the degree of exon skipping. The top band represents here exon 4 included, the bottom band exon 4 skip. So basically, with these morpholino antisense or splice switching oligonucleotides um, uh, in these cell lines, and MG63 is an osteosarcoma cell line that's ERG positive, VCAPS is a prostate cancer cell line that's also ERG positive, we can cause the skipping uh, of exon 4, particularly with the uh, SSO targeting the 3' splice site. And this can, uh, and this effect can actually. Uh, last with a single transfection for several days, uh, in this case 72 hours, we can still see uh, extensive exon skipping. And this then also correlates with a reduction in ERG protein. So, all right, so this is a uh, Western blot is a technique that allows us to measure uh, levels of a specific protein using antibodies to that protein. And what we see here is that with these splice switching oligonucleotides, we see that change in splicing at the pre-mRNA level, but then in terms of the protein outcome, we see a drastic drop in uh, levels of that protein shown here by the arrow. In this case, 72 hours after transfection of those antisense molecules. We also developed splice switching oligos to target that oncogenic cassette exon, and they also worked uh, in, the, in the two cell lines. Again, the SSO targeting the 3' splice site was the most efficient. Now, the Western blotting confirmation of this effect was trickier because the loss of 24 amino acids only causes a modest shift in the mo mobility of the protein, but uh, with high resolution gels, we were able to, uh, to show this. So, what you see here in the Western blot uh, bottom right is that with that uh, SSO targeting that cassette exon at the 3' splice site, we have a loss of the top band here, which represents exon 7b amino acids added to the protein. The bottom band represents the amino acids, the 24 amino acids uh, with that ERK docking site removed uh, from the protein as a result of the antisense oligo. Uh, so then we went on to measure cell proliferation and apoptosis, and we saw that the uh, uh, the, uh, the splice switching oligonucleotide, in this case the one targeting exon 4, caused a reduction in cell proliferation over a series of days, and also an increase in apoptosis. And this is also consistent with what we know about the, the physiological function of the ERG transcription factor. It regulates proliferation and apoptosis, and that's known. So what we see here is that if we reduce the activity of the levels of ERG protein in these cancer cell lines, we, re we reduce proliferation and we increase apoptosis, programmed cell death. And the exon 7b splice switching oligonucleotides also had a similar effect. So not only by reducing overall protein, ERG protein levels with the exon 4 antisense reagent, but also by targeting that oncogenic 
cassette axon that, remember, is preferentially included in advanced disease and that encodes this uh, conserved uh, stretch of amino acids with a NERC docking site. Well, if we cause its expression and um, its skipping, we also see reduced proliferation and increased uh, apoptosis in the cell line models. We also did some cell invasion assays and saw a reduction in, in cell invasion uh, with both uh, SSOs targeting exon 4 and exon 7b. So this is another oncogenic phenotype, the ability of, of the cancer cells to invade across a barrier. It was also reduced. And we also saw reduced levels of beta-catenin, which is an important uh, cancer marker as a result of uh, treatment with these um, antisense molecules. Again, in collaboration with Sabaltian at the University of Exeter, we did some xenograft work. Now, this is maybe not quite as impressive as the data with the click inhibitors, but we did see a reduction in xenograft growth uh, in, in the mice. And we persevered for, over, uh, for up to two months here, and we saw a decrease in the growth uh, of those xenografts. Um, this was our first stab at it, and we want to repeat this uh, with better controls uh, and additional delivery methods, more mice cohorts. This really has to be looked at further, but the initial results are encouraging in that uh, the, the xenograft growth seems to be uh, impaired. And finally, we started a collaboration with Hayley Whitaker at University College London. And what Hayley does is, so she's able to work with specimens from prostate tumors, and she can grow them in vitro uh, for up to a week uh, in these sort of plugs shown here in the bottom. These are actual real uh, bits of human prost uh, prostate tumors. And then they can be treated with various experimental drugs. So you can imagine that we then wanted to test our, uh, our antisense oligonucleotides. And indeed, we used them, so the exon 4 specific SSO here. Uh, we could show that in the human prostate tumor, that's ERK positive, that we see a reduction in the ERK protein. Now, we only had time uh, to do this on a cohort of five patients. And only one of these patients was ERG positive. So, you know, preliminary stab at this, uh, it seems that the, uh, the antisense molecules do have the ability uh, to transfect into this material and cause a reduction in a protein. Okay, so that, that's encouraging, but obviously we need to do this much more extensively. So to conclude then, the key message today, I hope, uh, is that targeting splicing can provide opportunities for the development of novel anti-cancer therapies. Now I've given you a couple of ideas to think about, but in this um, diagram here, which I uh, prepared for a review article, I just want to kind of give you a broader landscape of how we can develop, think of developing novel anti-cancer strategies, right? And I've, I've touched on a few of these today. So if you can imagine that we have growth stimulatory signals, all right, that regulate the activity uh, or, or, or switch on splice factor kinases, right, that further amplify signals. And then we have splice factors that get activated through or, or downstream of these, you know, growth stimulatory signals. They then go and modulate the alternative splicing of cancer-associated genes. Uh, and, and in cancer cells, uh, that alternative splicing changes uh, in a way that favors the growth of those uh, those cancer cells. So as cancer develops and progresses and spreads, there is selective pressure to change splicing to favor the tumor cells, right? And these splice factors are centrally involved in that. So we, we can think of developing drugs that inhibit the splice factor kinases, but also the splice factors themselves, or even drugs that uh, block the splicing machinery itself, so spliceosome inhibitors. And of course, we can think of developing then molecules that specifically target oncogenic splice isoforms. So I see the cancer medicine of the future to be splicing smart. So what I mean by that is that it's not just a matter of developing a drug you know, to, uh, to target our you know, favorite oncogene. We need to develop drugs that are isoform specific, that are splice isoform specific, okay? So these antisense molecules, which I talked about just now, 
uh, for example, could be targeting an oncogenic cassette exon. The advantage of uh, targeting a specific oncogenic cassette exon is that you might not be targeting the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, the non-oncogenic splice isoforms in, uh, that, are, that may be being expressed in, in normal tissues. And of course we can also develop drugs targeted against uh, the protein splice isoforms themselves uh, that are oncogenic. So the bottom line is, you know, I think there are lots of opportunities for developing novel drugs that uh, modify splicing for the benefit of cancer patients. So just to conclude there, I'd like to acknowledge our funders, Prostate Cancer UK. They funded uh, the development of a splice switching oligonucleotide project for a couple of years. Uh, UWE Bristol and also Gene Tools, with, uh, who provided us with some uh, reagents, uh, antisense reagents. And uh, finally, last but not least, Dr. Sean Porozinski, Samantha Jambe, Lisa Hobson, Laura Perry, and Bethany Clark for the uh, development of antisense uh, molecules. Uh, Simon Uzo, Chigeru Wadi, and Tarek Bilali uh, for the work on targeting the splice factor kinases. And my collaborators uh, shown here, and particularly Dr. Sebastian Oltian for the mouse xenograft uh, work. Uh, Dr. Jim Summerton, uh, uh, Gene Tools, he's the inventor of the Morpholinos. Uh, Professor Dave Bates uh, with his company Exonate developing the Sphinx compounds, Masatoshi Hagiwara, um, splicing, uh, splicing guru, an expert in the field, in the field particularly in development of splice factor kinase inhibitors at Kyoto, and finally Hayley Whitaker at UCL London, um, with whom we hope to collaborate further testing uh, these reagents. Thank you very much for your attention.